some people would refer to us as a hacker group. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about attacking network embedded systems, which basically does not cover mobile phones yet. We're talking about today pretty much like design failures and software vulnerabilities in embedded systems. Got an example for the two major things here. Um, design failures, um, we have like examples for different design failures that showed up during research in um, embedded system technology and how to exploit one. And we're basically covering the same thing for software vulnerabilities, um, well-known things like buffer overflows and stuff. And I think we just go on here. So what's an embedded system? For the purpose of this talk, um, an embedded system is a small computer, kind of like has a CPU, has some memory, um, maybe has some storage disk space kind of thing. And of course, it has a network interface. So this is pretty much all you need to have a device that you can possibly attack and play with. Um, it mostly has a custom operating system and this custom operating system is designed to do specific tasks in contrast to um, commonly used operating systems like Windows. The embedded systems most often have something really specific and monolithic of design. There is mostly no or very limited way to update stuff, um, to manage it, to patch it. Like, if you think of embedded systems, let's say in your 7 series BMW, it's, it's actually said to be based on Windows CE, but I don't really know that. Um, but you can't really buy a CD for your BMW, go to the car and like update it, which would have been kind of cool because those embedded systems had serious bugs like the BMW stopped running when it had like gas for still 120 kilometers, the board computing system kind of thought it's empty and so stopped working. Um, and the biggest problem we have in embedded systems is there is no separation um, of the tasks. There is no access levels inside the operating system, which basically means you execute one byte, you got the thing. There is no internal borders like um, running under different user accounts, memory protection, stuff like that. It's not there. Talking about design failures. What are design failures? I mean, undocumented functionality is one of the biggest things for embedded systems. We got things like developer backdoors. Everyone remembers developer backdoors in embedded systems? I mean, people put it in just to get debugging output or might access it if the telnet interface just died. And well, they just kind of keep it in there, don't document it, nobody's gonna find out, right? Um, next big thing, out of something features. Out of everything. Especially if you think of small routers, home devices, DSL routers, stuff like that. When you take them out of the box and you're like, John Doe, I have no, IB, uh, no idea about TCP IP guy, you take it out of the box, connect it to the network, actually manage to not put Ethernet on the ISDN port, and get the software CD out, put it in your computer, and it kind of magically finds out where the router is and says, okay, now enter the IP address or I'm gonna give it an IP address. Those out of something features can be really, really bad. And we got legacy functions, stuff that's put in to version one or maybe version two. And in version 34, nobody uses it anymore, but it's still there. And it's no longer considered part of the software. We actually had the situation talking with vendors of embedded systems and um, yeah, saying, look, there's this feature here, it's kind of old, but you can break into the system and they're like, what feature? Even the developers didn't know about it anymore. Then we got the all big ignored standards. I mean, we all know about um, certain vendors doing certain things. 
and, and not really following RFCs, like being on Windows, Black Hat, most people think of Microsoft probably now. Um, I'm more thinking about Cisco because you always got like the RFC and then you got a web page saying Cisco's understanding of the protocol, which is always kind of different than the RFC is. So <clears throat> those have kind of neat side effects. And we have an absolute uncontrolled increase of complexity in those systems. Now the worst thing for security that can happen is increase of complexity when you do not control it. Why? Because you've got different units, test every unit, every unit is fine, you put them all together, it falls apart. Um, we all know how that works. Um, I mean, in a, to, in a market today, you've got marketing coming in saying we need this and that new feature. Well, you got about two weeks time to code it. There is no time to think about which side effects could that possibly have on all the other features we had. Well, and this means at some point in time you get, bottom line, inconsistent access restrictions. First case, a design failure. This is a firewall built by Lucent. It's called the Lucent Brick. <laughs> kind of like goes along with the picture well. Um, it's a layer two firewall. The Bell Labs people came up with a pretty cool embedded system operating, so, embedded system operating system um, called Inferno. It's actually pretty good. And the firewall is based on Inferno. So this firewall is a layer two device. Pretty much it doesn't route. It just sits on the network um, and talks to both sides and just drops the traffic that's not nice. The thing is, for layer two device, the design failure is in the worst possible place. It's in the ARP cache design. The ARP cache, first of all, is built to not run on firewalls, but generally on layer two devices. So ARP requests and replies are forwarded through the firewall, whatever your rule set says. Like you say, drop every traffic, you can still send ARP requests through the firewall and get the answers which means you can basically ARP scan the whole network behind it and find out which hosts are up, despite the fact that the firewall was actually configured to not allow you doing that. The other problem is the ARP cache really takes every ARP reply it ever sees and caches it. For performance reasons, that kind of sounds like a good idea. You get an ARP reply somewhere, um, you cache it, you know where it is next time you don't have to ask. But it does not time out. Now imagine what happens if you like send out ARP replies continuously. What happens to a cache that does not time out and caches every ARP reply if you continuously send them? At some point in time it's full. And what happens is this firewall actually explodes all over itself and is that. The other thing with the replies is, if you like send an ARP reply here with the IP address of the LSMS server, which is the management solution for those loosened bricks. Um, so here you have all the rule sets configured and you have all the logging taking place. Now you send from the outside an ARP reply with the IP address of this server and a different MAC address. The firewall thinks, oh cool, update ARP cache here, new entry. And yeah, you are not going to manage your firewall anymore. Attacker sends one packet and you're out. Second case, SN routers. Um, actually now also Lucent. Here we have the case of an undocumented auto something feature. This is um, one of those protocols I just mentioned for taking a box out of like the original package and put it on your network and trying to find out how to configure it. This one works by sending a specially formatted UDP packet to the discard port. Now, UDP discard is supposed to, as the name suggests, discarding the packets. But if you send this special magic packet, um, it goes and fills the rest of the packet with kind of interesting information like IP address, net mask, um, here's the real MAC address from the internal ethernet interface, its name, serial number, stuff like that. Bad about this is it still works if the device is already configured. 
And since the operating system, in this case, Teos, um, is used in bigger devices, it still works on like huge dial in boxes, like um, Ascent, Ascent Max, not the TNT, but the other dial in boxes. They got like 60 ports, ISDN dial in. It still has this protocol. While you would never expect someone to set such a box up and not know what IP is and how it works. So the worst part about this is it's supposed to work automatically. So it takes the SNMP write community but in this special packet format um, as kind of a password. And you can change this information here, like the IP address and the name, and send it back with the message saying, write or configure, and having the SNMP write community in there. Now, even if you're turned off SNMP, this feature still works. Imagine what happens if you send such a packet with a new IP address to a big dial-in server. It gets a new IP address, which kind of like destroys the whole purpose <laughs> because it's no longer working. This is one of those protocols where you go ask the developers, OK, how do you turn it off? Which protocol? No, no, we don't do that. <laughs> they, they actually still run it, and nobody knows about it. They didn't even find it in the code. Another nice design failure, Cisco enhanced IGRP. Now, Cisco has the habit of like not just only interpreting um, RFCs kind of widely, but also inventing protocols, because those guys writing RFCs don't really know shit. Um, enhanced IGRP is a Cisco invention for a routing protocol. And it uses automatic neighbor learning. Like the neighbor announces, hey, I'm a new Cisco router. I want to participate in your autonomous system. And it just works, plug and play, fine. The thing is, how many neighbors could that possibly cover? Now, sending out lots of neighbor announcements with not existing IP addresses, spoofed IP addresses, um, happens to trigger the ARP request system in the router. Of course, because the router wants to talk back to you and push all your routing protocol information over to you. Now, you're not existing, so you're not answering. Usually, that would mean ARP will time out. After a while, three requests, then you're done. The problem is that this announcement, this neighbor announcement itself, has a hold time, which is in seconds. So it counts, can counts it down once a second, the whole time, to just find out if the neighbor announcement is still valid. And this kicks again off the ARP request process. Now, imagine what happens with several thousand neighbor announcements. Your router will use every possible amount of CPU power and network interface power to blast your network with op requests. As long as this hello packet is valid. Now, the timer is transmitted in the packet, which is a 16-bit number. So you go up to 18 hours valid. So it spends 18 hours trying to find you for several thousand, which means you send about 1,000 packet, and the Cisco router takes care of the network no longer working because it's busy forwarding op requests. For iOS 11, this is even possible to do as unicast. Usually, um, Enhanced IGRP does multicast, but the 11 series doesn't really look at that. So um, you can even send it across the internet. The problem here is, um, as you see, all iOS versions are affected. But for some reason, Cisco's solution is kind of like, none. We're not going to fix it. And so I, I came up with this device here to like, fix the problem. <sighs> Exploiting a design failure. HP printers. How many of you people have HP printers in their places? How many of those are networked? You will have fun when you return. Um, HP printers got va various access methods. You can like telnet to it. You can FTP over PostScript or text files, and they will print it out. 
Um, you can HTTP serve to their pages kind of thing. Um, you get, of course, SNMP, and you get something called PGL. Um, those access restrictions, um, no, those access methods are actually restricted by certain means of like authentication. You got an admin password, which is valid for Telnet and HTTP. You got the IP address filter thing, where you say only the certain subnet can access the box. Um, and you got the PGL has its own security scheme with the PGL password. Now, those things are not really consistent with each other. By going there, notice IP access restriction does not include SNMP. So you go to the printer and read this kind of funny looking OID here, and you get back a hex string. Now, this hex string happens to be the administrator password for the printer. So equipped with this password, you can now surf to the printer, um, log in with username laserjet. We tried admin over and over. It doesn't work. Um, and the password you just got off the printer. And well, you basically just owned the printer. Now here comes the interesting part. PGL already mentioned. It runs on what's called the app socket, application socket or whatever. It's port 9100. Um, and it's the printer job language. It's used to like set up your job when you send over um, your print job. It's like the preamble in the end of it that says use um, US letter paper, double-sided printed, um, highest quality, and with a green logo, whatever. This kind of stuff. So it basically sets that off. You can also use that to set the defaults on a printer. Now, this PGL has its own security scheme, as I said. Unfortunately, this password is just a number. It is a number in the range of 16 bits. Means 1 to 6535. Um, 65535. And, well, this actually takes about six hours remotely to brute force. I mean, the key space is really small. So there isn't really big security. Now, let's see what we can do with that. PGL, on top of like doing paper um, size configuration, allows access to the printer's file system. The printer has a file system. Now, you got um, the spool directory that's sitting either in DRAM or in flash or on a real hard drive um, that contains current print jobs. Those print jobs sent over to the printer are spooled there so he can like print it out later. And it contains the PCL macros. Now, lots of companies actually have PCL macros in their HP printers because it's kind of convenient instead of going to a printer's shop and have your letterhead printed on paper and then use this paper in your printer, you can put a PCL macro on there and have the letterhead like on the printer automatically being put on the page. Now you can actually access this and of course change it, which kind of like gives some fun. But there's more file system content. The later models actually have the full stuff on there, their firmware, the content of the web server, the embedded one that we just served to, and subsystem configuration for different subsystems. Now, think of your printer as a PGL-based file server. It also allows you, of course, since you got the right password, to change this content. Now, you can actually make this kind of like extensively and play with the file system. So what I tried was um, running a porn site of the printer in our office, which actually worked. Um, so, but it's also a pretty interesting part um, to like trade files with your buddies via the printer. <laughs> now this, this is from an um, 8150 laser jet. And you see, this is the file system. You see lots of stuff. Here, the, the already mentioned PostScript and PCL things, PGL. Default is actually a configuration directory. Um, you have the web server, obvious. Some TXT files, the library stuff, 
everything you want. And on the volume one, you got the spool. So you really like got full access. I mean, it's pretty much like a DOS drive. Now, it's kind of hard to do that by hand because you got the, the whole PGL thing is escape sequence based. So you have to like put together your escape sequence and then the commands and they're kind of arcane sometimes. So we thought, well, let's like write a tool for it. And there it is, PFT, um, the printer frustration tool. It's um, reading, modifying, writing environment variables, which is very, very funny because with the environment variables, you set the default ways. Like print 999 copies of everything. <laughs> kind of like makes it funny. You can also go and set the front panel to a certain security mode. The front panel security mode means it's not working. You set the front panel security to maximum, and people can spend the whole day pressing buttons. It's not going to do anything. Um, now, this tool also allows you the full file system access. The screenshot you just saw was from the command line version. But the real fun part isn't technically challenging, but really funny, is changing the display message. Now imagine what happens, the secretary goes over to the printer because the printer says, failure, I can't print, and the error message says, please insert coin. They spend a lot of time actually finding this little slot to put the coin in. Um, you can actually communicate with people in other office buildings um, using printers because you lock the front panel and you send error messages like, um, well, you ran out of like green ink. <laughs> or um, the paper tray 517 is empty, please refill. It's really funny, you can really communicate with people and it takes quite a while till they figure out what's happening. <laughs> now, since there are so many MCSEs all over the world, um, we figured we would go and, and write a GUI for it so you can play with that in Windows. <laughs> so this is how it looks like. Um, Notice this is not a copyright violation. <laughs> um, you got like the file system access, the environment variables, and the premium messages. This is how the file system now looks like. You can basically surf it like in your explorer. Um, and as I say, trade files, set up your own website on a printer, whatever you feel like. Um, yeah. It's getting worse. <laughs> there is this invention called ShyVM. ShyVM is a Java virtual machine for embedded systems developed by HP. Um, the 9000 series, um, 4100, are officially running the stuff. Um, other printers as the 8150 also run it. And it is a full-blown virtual machine for the web server. So it comes with like the web server itself, static files, which we can replace with porn content, um, and objects. The whole, the whole nine yards, it's all there. And everything lives on a printer file system, which we just saw we can access. Now, here's the scary part. This is from the HP website. Um, it's actually, yeah, from, from summer last year. The important part is the last three lines saying these appliances are powered by HP Shy embedded software. It does not mention printers. The thing is, HP Shy is sold all over the place for TV set top, set -top boxes, um, pay TV boxes, for even big storage area network systems. Now, we will see in a minute that the security of Shy VM is kind of questionable. Here it is. By default, it comes with a loader. Now, this loader is there so bright people, as the, the advertisement says, HP Invent, um, bright people can go to the printer and upload code. Now, they thought about, oh, that's scary. So what are you going to do to secure that? Um, OK, we, we make it validate the signature of the JAR file. The JAR file has to be signed by HP. Um, so we can first take a look at the software and not every single dude in a world can upload software. The problem here is, A, the default loader, this dot loader, 
doesn't really work. It's pure bad code, it does not work. And B, they figured nobody is gonna send them code to sign it. So they released something new, the easy loader. Now the easy loader, as the name suggests, makes it really easy for us. It is itself in a JAR file signed by HP, and after installation, it will not validate signatures anymore. Now here's the deal, you can forget about all that because we got file system access. And on a file system, as I said, in a default directory, there are configuration files, like csconfig. csconfig is a text file. This text file says, load the following class and um, put it on the following URL. So we can basically download the text file, modify the text file, upload the text file, put the Java classes on the printer, restart the printer, all fine. Um, the last point got an issue because well, HP still says it has nothing to do with like us being on DEF CON and doing this talk, but um, shortly after DEF CON, the whole HP shy business unit um, official stuff was shut down. So the documentation and all that stuff is no longer available, but luckily, um, just before they shut it all down, they released the shy server as open source under the LGBL and some people still mirror, mirror it. We have a link on the website to um, one mirror that actually has the shy server still, so if you wanna play with this stuff, um, it's available. This is just like a graphical representation on how to get your code on a printer, either the clicky, clicky browser way, um, upload easy loader, um, get easy loader running, which is automatically done and then like upload your jar or like modify the csconfig file and put your own classes on. Now the problem is, ShyVM isn't really stable code. Um, if you do Java, threads are kind of important sometimes, especially for server processes. Well, if you do too many of those, ShyVM dies. If you try to connect to a closed port on some printer models, it will kill ShyVM. Kind of silly, actually. Um, it doesn't even always throw exceptions. Well, Java without exceptions is kind of like not very useful. Instead of throwing an exception, it will just crash the printer. Um, and well, there is this, this little nice um, shy server thing, um, and you can install that on a normal Linux box or even Windows box if you feel like. Um, but if your code runs on your box in like the simulation environment, it's not saying it will run on your printer. You know, no, there are differences. So if you wanna play with that or research some of the possible applications, um, this OID here is kinda important because if you set it to four, it will reboot the printer and you will find out you need this quite frequently. Yeah. Things you can do. Now we got a full-blown printer with a CPU actually a pretty good MIPS CPU, um, and network connectivity, stuff like that. So what could we do? First of all, we implemented a web-based port scanner. You go to your printer, enter the target host, say scan ports, do something different, come back like half an hour later and check which ports are open. Very funny if the scan system is monitored by an IDS. I had a guy actually um, running to the phone or being on the way to the phone calling ISS and complaining about how shitty their IDS is because ReSecure was telling him his printer is port scanning his web server. <laughs> it's really interesting. <laughs> now, as I said, we got a big fat CPU and usually the thing just prints. So it's kind of like not really used. And we thought, why always use those cool processing cycles on my laptop to crack passwords when I got a MIPS CPU sitting there? So we wrote Shy Crack, which again is web-based for your convenience. You go there, enter your crypt string, um, enter the characters that you want to brute force through, and just let the printer do the work. And the best thing about it, um, it still prints. The magic of multitasking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
you can do actually you can do a lot of stuff um, like binding to listen and binding and listening on, on funny ports, um, providing services, stuff like that. In the near future, we're gonna release things like um, transparent TCP proxies for printers, so you can like chain up five printers um, through the internet and then like hide yourself all over the place. Well, yeah, you can do whatever you want with. Well, who wants to code in Java anyway? Um, yeah, this is how shy crack looks. Kind of basic, but works. There are shy services available from HP. Um, so shy services have some, some interesting side effects. First of all, they're fully trusted. If you're a shy service, someone else is a shy service, you can do whatever you want to him. Second, there are things like shy PMP. Find other printers. Kind of cool. Took over one printer and then like extend your shy service by shy PMP and make it like distribute itself around the printers. Talking about a printer wall. It's so easy. It's about mm, four or five screen pages Java. Um, there is a notifier service. This one is really sweet, really, really sweet. Um, you can tell it to notify you of interesting events. Now, definition of interesting events for me is like the CEO is printing something um, six in the evening. It might be interesting. Um, you can actually, with a bit of coding, you can actually make the printer send you a copy of that print job just so you got informed and yeah, maybe he's firing some important people, maybe you wanna buy or sell your stocks, whatever. Um, you can also get this by email, of course. The absolute worst thing, shy mail, is, as it says on the documentation, designed to work across firewalls. Now, how does it do that? It's no magic. The printer gets an email account, a pop account, configured somewhere out in the internet, let's say Hotmail. Now, it will pull this account every once in a minute to see if there is new email. You send an email there with commands for shy services. You will take the email, look for the commands for shy services, start the service according to your email, and send you back an email with the result. Excellent! <laughs> so you don't even need to access the printer itself. You send him an email. It's so silly. If you want to play with the printers in your company, um, here's where the tools are. Just download the stuff. It's all open source. But don't look at the Windows code. We don't live on Windows. Software vulnerabilities. Now, let's go to the, discussing the classic mistakes. The classic mistakes are also made in embedded systems because embedded systems developers are not any brighter or smarter than any other developers. They just got smaller devices. So we have input validation issues, format string, buffer overflow, even cross-site scripting. The HP printers, example, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. All over the place, you can store like JavaScript code on that. Next time the administrator tries to access it, he got like 500 windows. Um, but the most scary thing is embedded system HTTP daemons. I have to see one single HTTP daemon on an embedded system that is not absolutely broken by default. The idea seems to be that, wow, well, I got a limited device resource. It's so small, it's like I can't really do error checking and length checking and other computing intensive stuff, so I just leave it out. Seems to be the idea. Talking about interesting overflows. This is cursory checks. We didn't really like research the devices, we just got our fingers on it and played about 10 minutes, 15 minutes, two hours with it and got a buffer overflow somewhere. So it's not really complicated. First case, ZDI router. It's now, again, a loosened product. It's an excellent router, really good router. Got like um, full-blown quality of service stuff. All mm, pretty good. Command line interface with TCL scripting, so they really know what they're doing. The web server, long request, 2,000 characters, boom, router gone. Network printer from brother, in this case. You don't even need to send an HTTP request yourself. You go with the browser to the web page, 
saying, I want to configure the printer. It asks you for a password. You're holding the AT for a while. You click on Submit. It dies. The HP Procode switch is really cool. Normally, if you got like SNMP write access to a switch, um, you're all done. You're all set. But this one is kind of different because you got HTTP, um, you got SNMP write here, and you fill this OID here with like 85 characters. The system will not die. Everything works as expected until the administrator tries to access the device via Telnet or HTTP. Then it crashes. <laughs> Talking about a trap. I mean, if you're breaking into a network, it's kind of cool to do this first because if the connectivity is gone, you know someone tried to find out what you're doing, but they didn't have a chance because they just killed their switch. And even some really small devices. SEH is a German-based small company. Um, they sell or used to sell pocket print servers size of a cigarette pack. Um, for those Americans, non-smoking, this is a cigarette pack. Um, this thing also has a web server. This web server, again, send a GET request, long password in it, boom, it crashes and resets itself. Now, the funny part is, um, since it's directly connected to the printer port on a printer, the Centronix port, it will, by resetting itself, reset the printer, which is real bad during a print job on a laser printer. It kind of like crashes the whole idea of the laser printer, so if you do that multiple times, there will be collateral damage. We tried that. This is how the device actually looks. You see, it's kind of small, really. Now, here are the common misconceptions. First of all, embedded systems are so hard to exploit. It's way harder than multipurpose else's. You have to like, reverse engineer the whole thing, like get the binary down, fire up IDA, get yourself a memory upgrade first, um, put the whole image in IDA and reverse engineer everything so you know about syscalls, library functions, stuff like that. And since you're not going to do that, the worst thing that can possibly happen to your device is, well, it crashes. Um, well, that's my statement. Um, <laughs> the idea was to once prove it wrong. And we have the habit of like um, choosing Cisco as a primary target for just because they're a nice target. Um, so the idea was exploit an overflow in Cisco IOS and take over the router, really own the box. Um, the thing is, the process you're crashing in Cisco IOS is not really a, a process as in, in Windows or Linux, so it's really tightly integrated in the operating system, so if you crash something, um, if you overflow something, it will crash. I mean, we all know that from Cisco routers, as soon as they don't feel happy anymore, they reboot or want to be rebooted. So, According to Cisco now, memory corruption is like 85% of all issues they got. Um, explicit or implicit, it is always memory corruption that's the bad thing. So the assumption was it's probably a heat-based overflow. So we got a vulnerability for research here. Um, it's a plain, simple buffer overflow with TFTP. If you make your um, Cisco TFTP server, so it serves out the um, iOS image. You send in a request with a long name for the file you want to get, and it kind of crashes. Now, it says here iOS 11.1 to 11.3. How many people of you here in the room know that there is um, iOS 12? That's not too much. OK, um, let's do it other way around. How many people are running Cisco's here? OK, keep your hands up, please. Thank you. Um, how many people are kind of sure that they only run 12 series iOS? OK, how many of you guys are sure that um, the boot iOS you're running is also 12? One left. <laughs> the Microsoft guy, isn't it? <laughs> um, the thing here is. When Cisco's boot, they got two IOSs. First, they got like a ROM mon kind of thing. Then they kick off what's called the boot helper image. 
it's like a mini iOS and it's less frequently updated or it translates to never because this thing is there are not many versions that actually work. So even if you want to upgrade your boot iOS to 12.0 or 12. something, you can't because if you get a 12 series boot loader image, it doesn't work. That means every time you reboot your router for about 10 seconds, it's vulnerable like the old versions of iOS are. Because the bootloader actually reads, parses, and executes the configuration before kicking off the real iOS. And the time between running the configuration and finally kicking off the real iOS is between 5 and 10 seconds, which is more than enough to do an overflow. And it's kind of funny because if you mm, make this overflow wrong, so it like didn't work and it crashes, even if the boot iOS crashes, it will still load the other, the real iOS, so nobody's going to notice it. This is from Cisco's TFTP advisory, and actually they continue saying that. Summary of this text, worst possible thing um, is, well, it crashes. It could be a denial of service. Let's see if that's right. Okay. Here's what the router says if you overflow something. Red zone, um, does anyone find this 4141 kind of familiar? Yeah, have you seen that before? It's um, hex for all A. So if someone puts an A strip somewhere, lots of A's. <clears throat> well, that is actually part of the file we requested. So we obviously overwrote something really interesting. And as it says down here, corrupted red zone. Um, let's see if we can do that. So how does the heap actually look? The heap on, on iOS is linked list memory blocks. They're linked together. There are actually two different kinds of memory. One is called the main memory. It's pretty much like processing. You have the iOS sitting there. You have um, some, some buffers, input buffers. You have the stuff for processing the console, stuff like that. Um, and you got the I.O. memory. The I.O. memory is more for like fast packet oriented storage. Fixed size memory blocks, small, medium, large, extra large, kind of like with the t-shirts. Um, and mostly different type of RAM, depends on a router type. The bigger ones have really different types of RAM. Um, I.O. memory is sitting on a different bus um, running with different ways to organize memory. But in general, there are always linked lists. Typical picture, like you have a next pointer pointing to the next block, you have a previous pointer previous pointing to the previous block kind of thing, just a linked list. So one of those blocks got a header, then got the data here grayed out and broken, and a red zone. It has magic. Like, here begins memory block, which is a static value. You, you got the process ID. You got something which I really find absolutely hilarious. It's um, the alloc check space. Now, every process is given four bytes of memory in the block header to put some dynamic um, canary in there and validate that and make sure nobody overwrote your block. Now, I have to find one single process in iOS that actually uses it. None does. Then you got like a pointer to the name of your process, um, the malloc address kind of thing, um, where the malloc actually happened. This is the program counter address there. Then you got your next pointer, previous pointer. You got a size field, how big the block is. And the most significant bit here is saying if it's in use or not. On top of that, you got a reference count, how many processes are referencing to this block. Um, so it's kind of like double information, and nobody actually uses the reference count. And you get a red zone, which is a static canary. This is the one we just overflowed. Now, the theory of the overflow here, what we're trying to do is we have a host block. 
I call it host block because it's like hosting my data. Um, and we got the next block here. So the idea is if we fill our data, we write, we hit this border here, and then we overwrite the header of the next block. Pretty much like every kind of heap exploit on, on Windows, Linux, same idea. And the desired result, of course, is like writing to arbitrary memory allocations or make iOS do funny things with our block information. And this is how it's supposed to work. Make things short, um, it works best when the block is freed. Now here's the thing about um, free on iOS. It's, remember, it's a double linked list. And upon a free, one of those blocks is taken out. It's a pointer exchange taking place, so this block here is no longer in a linked list of used blocks. Kind of makes sense. So this is pretty much what happens in, in C, and this is pretty much what happens in like pixels. So it's just taken out here and no longer in a linked list. When we overflow such a block, we need to know which information in the block header is actually checked by iOS. The magic is checked to find out if it's really a memory block. Could be something different, sure, sitting in RAM. Um, the PID is not checked. This, as I said, dynamic canary, nobody cares about. It's never checked. Um, those addresses are more for debugging purpose. The next pointer, pointing to the next block, is also not checked. Nobody cares about it. The previous pointer is. Um, the size is, and the red zone is. Now the question is, who checks that? They got a daemon for this. This daemon or process is called check heaps. And I got the impression this whole thing was invented because 85% of all bugs in iOS are memory corruptions. Because without this process, <laughs> the wonders of modern GSM communication. OK. Um, without this process, it would probably um, take some more time to find out if someone wrote somewhere he was not supposed to. So they, iOS coders had issues debugging it. Um, that's probably the reason for having this process. So what this process does is it starts the linked list from top to bottom and goes, looks at every single block and says, hey, are you OK? Checks the red things here. Um, and it gets kicked off twice a minute. And some of those checks are also done when you do a malloc or a free in iOS. Um, so just if you allocate memory, it just makes sure that there is still some kind of valid memory structure. But as we see, since the magic is a static value, and all this stuff here is not checked, we can actually fill the buffer up to here, leave all this stuff here alone, and um, see what it does. So what it does is exactly what we expected. We're taking the first victim. The 2500 routers, it's one of the so-called shared memory routers because I.O. and main memory are in the same chip kind of thing. Um, this one allows anything and anyone to write into NVRAM. Now, NVRAM is kind of interesting on a Cisco router. Does any, anyone have an idea what um, like the NVRAM is for? Come on. Good morning. I'm here. Yeah. It stores the configuration. Now, if you control the configuration, you control the router, right? So the idea is let's like write something into NVRAM. The good thing about NVRAM is it's checked. It's checked for integrity. Of course, you don't want to run with like a funny configuration. So um, it has a checksum. Now, what happens if this checksum is wrong? It will not load the configuration. Now, on the other hand, a router without a configuration is kind of silly. It, well, what are you going to do? Nike over to the router and fix it? So as a kind of backup plan, it goes out on the network and tries to find someone to provide a configuration. Now what we are doing here is we do this overflow, um, have 
This is the red zone, static value, because we like terminate the first block nicely. Um, this is the magic. Um, this is all kinds of crap. And this is the memory address of the NVRAM on a 2500. We send that over, and this is what happens. We send over the little overflow. The router figures out, oops, memory problem, check heaps goes, oh, la, 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 all bad. Um, better reboot. That's like the standard solution of Cisco, reboot. So router doesn't like its memory anymore, reboots. Now, figures out there is no config, or there is a config, but it's kind of like broken. So goes out, asks TFTP broadcast, could someone please provide me with a configuration? And of course, being nice, we are actually going to do that. Welcome, you just own the router. But that's kind of like you have to be on the same subnet. Um, it's only the 2500s. Yes, it is the most sold router, but being on the same subnet 2500, kind of restrictive. So let's make this thing remote. Previous pointer, as I said, is checked. The previous pointer points to the block, previous to that one, as the name suggests. Now, the thing is, the check always happens when the block before that is validated. It goes and like looks, OK, this block here points to another block. So I go see if the thing it points to points back to me, which is a pretty good test. And it's hard to come by. Actually, there is no way to fake anything. You have to provide the correct value, which makes exploitation a little bit tricky. Since you need the exact value, well, you need to make it somehow predictable. You can't just guess around, because every time it boots, it takes about two minutes to come back up. Um, so what you do is one uncontrolled overflow. Just send a bunch of A's over. The thing crashes and comes back up. Now, when it comes back up, it has a kind of predictable memory layout. You pretty much know where it is. Um, the best thing is if you got access to the syslog server or console output, even if you cannot log in. Um, often you can see the syslog packets going by. You see the crash log. You see the logging messages saying, hey, I crashed, the memory was corrupted at the following address. So you got the address. It's not a real cool way to do that, but I couldn't find a better one, quite frankly. As I said, it works best when you do a free. So let's look at the free memory blocks. A free memory block has, on top of all that overhead we already saw, consisting of 40 bytes overhead for a single byte allocated, um, got more memory management stuff in here. It got some padding here that actually used to have some meaning. Um, you got a second magic, kind of free magic, that says this block is free. You got yet another address, which is um, pointing to the place that freed this block. And padding, more padding. Then you have a free next and a free previous. Now, those two are, again, pointers in a linked list. But this time in a different one, this is probably, that's an assumption, I don't know that, um, a linked list of free memory blocks. So iOS can actually walk down free memory blocks in a linked list and say, OK, is this one big enough? No. Is this one big enough? No. Is this one big enough? Yeah, cool. So instead of checking, is this free? No. Go to the next, check if this free block takes too long. So the nice thing about those free blocks, those two pointers are not checked at all. Check heaps does not care about free blocks. So we got two pointers that are used in a pointer exchange when the free block is taken out of the list of free blocks, um, or when memory is, I can't even pronounce the word, um, merged together. It got a word, coescalated, is that correct? Yeah. Um, so when it's merged together, you have two free blocks, like five free bytes and 10 free bytes. It's kind of better to merge them together to have 15 free bytes. And since you get rid of all the overhead um, for the allocated memory blocks, it actually saves quite a lot of space. So 
when they're merged together, this memory, um, this pointer operation here takes place, where pr free previous is pointing to gets the value of free next and vice versa with the offset of 20. We got a point that actually does a pointer exchange unchecked, so we can write to arbitrary memory. Now, where do, should we write to? I mean, the, the process space is kind of big, right? So you better find a good place to write your pointers to, so it has some effect. Here is the deal. We got a process array. Process array seems to be an idea they had quite a while ago. Um, having an, literally an array of process IDs um, pointing to memory blocks. Those memory blocks, um, I call them process record because it's like a chunk of data consisting of all possible information um, for a process. So like pretty much like the task switching context in, in Linux. And the second element of this process record actually points to the process stack. So now we got like a place where we can overwrite things. We can put a new pointer here, 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 somewhere. Those are all pointers. We got a pointer exchange, so we can like replace them. This is what we do, taking a processor. Um, the stack is writable. The memory all over the place, except for the NVRAM, is mostly writable. So we can actually replace lots of possible pointers. We could replace the frame pointer of our called function, pretty much like in every other exploitation. The return address, of course. The process array entry, the whole process record, stack entry, stack pointer entry, whatever we feel like. There's lots of things we can actually replace. The good thing about those process information tables and stuff is they got a pretty static place in memory. It's not that they're like roaming around and are in different memory areas every time. They are static per iOS image, which sounds pretty cool, but in contrast to Windows where you need like four values um, for like Windows no service pack, service pack one, service pack two, service pack three, and it increases with every service pack, the amount of Cisco images is a little bit higher. My last count is 33,000. No joke, there are 33,000 different iOS images on the Cisco FTP server. So it's kind of like limited um, how static static is in this case, but it's at least a place you can write your stuff to. Now we got the question of the buffer. We got the execution redirected to wherever we want. Now we better provide some code. The problem here is the free we're using um, actually clears the memory. So if we overwrite something here and then the free happens, this memory is overwritten by OD, 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 OD. I don't know if that's like an indication for O day, no idea. But the thing we wrote the fake header for is now considered a free block. A free block is already free, so someone already cleaned it. And I was not gonna check if that's true or not. So we can actually append the exploit buffer here. Okay, now we need shell code. It's kind of tricky to do shell code for a system that really doesn't follow the idea of a shell. So what we do is get rid of iOS right away. Don't care about the operating system running on the embedded system. We got a CPU for which we got a manual. In this case, for the 1600, it's a Motorola CPU. Um, we got the problem that the NVRAM is protected but this is also some function of the CPU. So we look at the manual. There is a memory protection register right here. So we know how to write there. Um, well, simply assembly. Um, and we know what to write there. Like we take away this bit that says protected. And well, we disable the memory protection and write to the NVRAM. Either 
we can st still do this here, like write invalid values somewhere in, in VRAM, like a stamp, and the device reboots, doesn't know what the config is, ask for a config. But it's still local, right? So um, this is actually the code snippet for removing the memory protection. Don't be scared of this little bit assembly. There's more coming. Um, it's just loading the right addresses, moving it over, and like writing right into NVRAM. Kind of simple. Now we want to do that actually make that remote. We overflow once to get a predictable memory layout. We overflow a second time with fake block and the correct previous pointer, which is one of the hard parts. The size field, oh, I forgot to mention that. The size field. The size is checked, as I said. The check here is if it's um, terminating on memory boundaries or terminating to the next block. So it's kind of intelligent, but it's a 32-bit 30, um, field. And the most significant bit, as I said, is usage. If you fill it with 7FFF, that basically would be the maximum size. Some operation in iOS, I have no idea where, um, seems to be either with signed and unsigned buck, like you have a signed and an unsigned variable and you like move it over, or is using um, addition or shifting or stuff so it flips over and becomes zero. And having this size field here um, is valid. It's checked and it will pass the check. We have the free next pointer who points to our code, and the free previous points to the return address of some stack from some process. Now, you better take a process that it's not highly active and called every five seconds. Um, the worst possible process to take is virtual exec, because that has a very, very unpredictable stack layout. You never know where it currently is. Those little helper processes like load meter kicked on once a minute to check how big the load on the box is, um, once a second, is, yeah, those are perfect because they run a specific cycle of calls and return. And so you actually know the state for, of um, 60 seconds minus 10 milliseconds of runtime for load meter. For those 60 seconds, it's like, stable state, frozen state. And we have like code to unprotect memory and write into the NVRAM. This is still like overflowing um, and just invalidating the NVRAM. We invalidated it. It says notice NVRAM invalid possibly due to write arrays. Maybe they change it in the future and say possibly due to exploitation attempts. Um, then it says loading network config from IP address. Hey, yeah, I got a network config. Cool. Press return to get started or get owned. Um, remote shell code isn't much different. The only thing we do is we append the new config to the buffer that already contains our code. We send it over. Code gets executed. Instead of writing crap in NVRAM, it will disable the interrupts just to make absolutely sure iOS isn't doing anything anymore. Um, unprotects the NVRAM, copies the thing over, makes sure that the NVRAM header and all that, of course it's like mini file system, so it got like a header, um, that the NVRAM header is correct, checksum and length fields, that's pretty much it, and write it to the NVRAM slowly it's kind of funny when we first wrote that. The code ran, the box rebooted, came back up. You look at the memory, and like every second byte of the config we submitted was there. Just every second. And I was like, what the hell? And, and checking the code, found out, no, the code works. The problem is NVRAM chips aren't fast. You have to wait until the write actually happened. You can't just loop through it and, and write byte by byte by byte by byte. It's more like byte, byte. <laughs> That's how it works. This is why it kind of like takes a while to copy a config. Um, but yeah, if you do it slowly, it works. 
you have to erase the old config so the checksum isn't broken. Um, and then, just to be nice, we do a clean, hard reset of the processor. Tell the processor do reset. Has two good things to it. First of all, it doesn't like crash hard. Um, and when it crashes, sometimes iOS, the bootloader iOS installs kind of an exception handler. This one will write a stack trace or at least some context information on what went wrong in the NVRAM, sometimes destroying um, the checksum we just calculated for a new config. I'm not entirely sure why it sometimes happens and sometimes not. On the other hand, if we do a clean reset, if someone inspects the device later on, he will not see that it was exploited because it says, I got resetted by the administrator saying reload. Well, the only difference now, of course, is that they don't know the password anymore. Um, yeah, we put that all together for the TFTP thing. Um, it's just the overflow, a fake block, a bootstrap code, because you have the classic string things like, oh, there is a zero in the code, and, and that terminates the string, la la. So you do the classic circumvention of that problem by having a bootloader code with um, no zeros in it, and then the rest of the code XORed, um, and the new config as well, so it's all like non-null stuff. And yeah, sends it over. You can adjust certain values here. It's, yeah, you can download it if you feel like. And this is how it looks like if it actually works. You see no complaining about exceptions and stuff. It just clean reboots here. Um, it says, oh, config newer, um, configuration, funny version here. Never saw that before. Um, here it actually says set up new interface BRI. It's also priced to find a BRI interface on a 1600. That's because our minimum config appended to the buffer didn't mention anything about a BRI interface. The nice thing about it, it doesn't really complain about. It just says, well, yeah, got a new interface. Put it in shutdown mode. Doesn't care. Um, so it actually works if you just configure the Ethernet interface or whatever interface you use to attack it. And this is the config. You just tell it to the box. Well, you provided the config, so you know the passwords. You just log in. You own the router. That's more like the technical information um, here. This is how the whole memory block um, looks like when you send it over, the fake header. It's kind of like, well, it's probably better in the in printouts anyway. Um, greetings to the Chaos Computer Club. Um, this is the bootloader code that does not contain any zeros and, well, decodes the rest of it. And this is how you do a clean reset on Motorola CPU. Eh, mildly interesting. This one is really fun. I named it OopsPF because it's like OSPF overflow. They have a very interesting bug, um, which is actually documented and known for about a year. Um, in 11.2 up to 12.0, the OSPF also does neighbor tracking. As explained with the enhanced IGP before, you send out hello packets in OSPF, and it's like, oh, cool, new neighbor. Now, some dude at Cisco thought you will never, ever have more than 255 neighbors. Typical case of someone coming from small site computing and thinking that class C is the biggest and half of the internet. No, it's not. So having more than 255 neighbors, of course, overflow something. That's like kind of the logic thing in iOS. Um, it is interesting for several reasons. First, it's not seeing a packet. The TFTP thing was like all in a buffer. You could put everything interesting in one buffer, your code, your new config, everything you wanted. Um, this time, it is not single packet. This time we have to like puzzle this stuff together. Um, second, it's now in I.O. memory. As I mentioned, there's main memory and I.O. memory. Now it's in I.O. memory. So we got like a little bit different memory structure stuff. Hmm, have to see. And the overflow is not at the end of the memory blockchain. 
which is a problem because for um, this free block merging, we better be somewhere at the end where more free blocks are um, available, so there is something actually to merge. Otherwise, a free would actually free the block and just, yeah, keep it at that. So, exploitability. Um, the overflow is actually a table of the router IDs of the discovered neighbors. So out of the whole OSPF hello packet, four bytes, the router ID, which is usually an MP address, is taken and written to a table. Now this table grows and eventually overflows some memory structure. The source IP address for the halo, of course, has to be in the range that says the network statement for like expected neighbors, otherwise it's gonna be dropped anyway. And of course, to have more than 255 neighbors, you need a net mask um, smaller than slash 24. Now, um, this list entry, this router neighbor entry is very good because first of all, we're allowed to send null bytes. And second, since the router ID could be any possible combination of four bytes, we are not restricted in what we are sending over. We can send whatever we want. Makes it a whole lot easier. Um, iOS IO memory. This one uses dynamically scaled list of fixed block sizes. As I said, it's like in a t-shirt store, you got small, medium, large, x-large, huge, extra huge, tent. Um, so that's the same with like the blocks here. You got small blocks in a chain, then you got medium-sized blocks in a chain, big blocks in a chain. There are different buffers, really depending on the type of router you're dealing with. The small shared memory routers like the 1600s, it's, well, just buffers. Um, they're all in the same memory area. But for the bigger ones, it's different. Having the same design for the overall iOS thing um, means that they got public buffer pools where basically every interface is allowed to grab some, some buffer space off. And private interface pools where the blocks are actually the size of the maximum packet size possibly received by the interface. It's kind of good design, actually. It's kind of speedy. Um, and the allocation, deallocation, actually depends on some values. You got the permanent amount of buffers, the minimum amount, the maximum, um, minimum free, maximum free, um, and you got all kinds of values. Actually, it's kind of tricky. Um, and as long as it still is between the, the lower and the higher thresholds, they will not allocate memory, they will not free memory. Buffers in most operating systems like FreeBSD are fixed. Here they are dynamically scaled, but not very often. It has to be an exceptional traffic condition. So what we're doing here is like, dear Cisco, piece that together for me. We send over OSPF hellos and, well, kind of like puzzle together the same memory block thing we did before with router IDs. Works. So with every pack we're sending over, we got four bytes of buffer. Um, the overflow actually happens, that's why the animation went this way, um, but on the top, because we're first overflowing it, and we're first sending it over, and what happens is a copy operation. It takes the old list, adds a new entry at the top and copies it back into memory. Um, we can actually do 1,024 bytes here because, yeah, 256 by four. We can even do larger buffers, but that would actually require us to have an even smaller net mass. And at a certain point, like with a flat class A, you probably don't run OSPF. Memory management tricks. As I said, we're not at the end of the memory chain, so we have to convince it somehow to um, merge free blocks together that do not really exist next to each other. 
Um, so we need some memory management tricks. Most of you probably have this experience that sometimes you have to trick around with management so you get what you wanted. Same here. Um, the overflow block header is, as I said, in the middle of the chain. So it's, well, kind of useless. The exploit um, actually goes ahead and builds the block header in a way that for the buffer list, the list of actually used buffers, it's they're pointing to the buffers, to the buffer as well. One is free, I don't care. But for the memory manager that tries to merge the free blocks together, this one is actually at the end. Remember, we got two linked lists, one for the real blocks, used and free, one for the free blocks. Yeah, nobody says that those two information have to be like correct for each other. We can make the one pointing at the end of the memory, the other one pointing to the next block. So if everything works fine, we got something like here, if you do like show memory, IO memory, um, we got packet data, packet data, packet data, packet data, here we are. We basically terminate the memory list there. It still works because the um, buffer pointers are pointed directly into the memory segments where it's supposed to write to. It's no linked list because it will take ages for every received packet to go down the linked list and find the right buffer. So they got like the pointers cached. The funny part about this one is you send it all over, it worked, and the exploit is dormant. Nothing happens. The pointers are all good. There is no allocation or free taken place. So our faked pointer information is not used so far. So it's sitting there. And we really tried that. We really ran like um, serious TCP IP sessions over a router that had this like kind of funny memory layout now. It stays stable. What you do is you activate the exploit at some point in time by either um, sending heavy traffic load, complex routing updates, something like this. It figures, oops, need buffers. Um, best, I need uh, uh, small buffers. Allocates buffers, 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 buffers. You stop sending, it goes like, oh, lots of buffers. What I'm doing? Ah, I free them. They get freed. Then the memory management goes, oh, lots of free buffers. Let's merge them. Boom. Executed the code. Or you call up the guy and say, look, there is this evil Cisco worm coming out, and the only way to protect is like, go to configure mode and say buffer is small, permanent zero. Next thing you know, he executed your code. You can do it whenever you want. This is a mi minimum iOS config that we actually included in this whole OSPF send over kind of thing. Um, the fun part is iOS always, always parses the configuration the same way. You know that you can um, do short commands if it's clear what the command is supposed to do, um, you can shorten it. The same thing happens when it loads the configuration from the NVRAM or from the network. So you're not required to write full-blown um, configuration. This is like as small as you can get. Um, has everything you need, an enable password, the password is C. Um, IP address on the Ethernet interface, a default route, because, well, remote, you want to like reach it again. Um, the configuration for the Telnet interface, a password, and the login statement, and that's pretty much it. You don't need more. And this is how it looks like when it actually happens. Um, it boots, yeah, legal, blah, blah, geek info, and then we have like the interfaces rediscovered, and well, of course, you provided the password, so you can tell it to. Work to do. As you see, there is lots of well-you guess words. Lots of well-you guess words. Um, for the OSPF overflow, you need about six values known. It's, well, way um, far away from being as stable as like a TESO SSH exploit. It's really more in a lab environment and will not lead to a Cisco IOS warm published tomorrow. 
I would know about that. Um, so we have to map commonly used addresses, find better ways than um, doing this previous pointer guesswork after overflowing, um, and basically produce stable exploits, maybe stack-based, could be. There are stack-based issues in iOS. Um, I used to say there aren't, but people way brighter than I am um, slapped me in the face and said, well, look, here is one. So forget what I said. There are stack-based problems in iOS, and it's probably going to be easier. The other thing is NVRAM and config. Sometimes it's stored on Flash, so um, you want to write on Flash chips instead of NVRAM. That's easy. Just get the manual. Anti-forensics code, kind of like funny, write some, some funny error message in NVRAM and reboot the box. If someone is really trying to do router forensics, he will figure out that the broken interface was the problem because the NVRAM says so. Or do like shellcode that actually real time modifies the configuration, takes off all the access list bindings, and makes your router really just route and, and not firewall. Probably all kinds of stuff possible. So what's, what's the point? Well, first of all, just because it's black box, it doesn't mean you cannot exploit it. Second, um, most iOS heap overflows are actually exploitable. If you go to cisco.com, got an account, log in, check the bug database, you can actually query it around, find lots of issues in different iOS versions that are exploitable just by querying the bug database. Protocol-based exploitation, we just saw two examples of that. Um, debug-based, kind of funny, because the debug messages, if you debug something on the console or on the telnet, um, the debug messages seem to have a fixed size buffer where the string is built in. Um, if you overflow that buffer by providing some long data, and saying debug this and that protocol, and this and that protocol had a real long string in there, um, it often overrides a buffer in heap by building this debug output. Kind of funny. And well, at the end of the day, nobody updates their routers. So if you write an exploit for 11.1, you probably still get half of your company. And if you do this NVRAM invalidation thing, well, it still contains all the passwords that are probably the same all over the campus for routers. They all have the same enable password and all have the same telnet password, and those are heavily encrypted. Does everyone know that this was a joke? <laughs> no, um, there is actually two different encryptions. Um, one is real MD5, which is called enabled secret, but mostly used, and for telnet password, you're not even, I don't think you're even able to do it otherwise. Um, there is this Cisco password type 7 encryption, which is just a silly X or with a known string that sometimes someone found. So um, if you see that, you just grab your mobile phone, surf to our web page, and like enter the string and instantly get the password. Free service. OK, how to protect? Well, first of all, do not rely on one type of device for protection. If everything in your shop says Cisco, you're toast. If everything in your shop says Checkpoint, you're toast as well. Layered security. Welcome in the world of layered security. It is important on your network to have different things. I'm not saying um, you should get a zoo and every possible router on the planet. Let me tell you, um, most other routers are even worse. But a little bit of like multi-culture thing, two different routers or at least two different firewall brands would be cool. Um, consider all your networked equipment vulnerable. At some point in time, some sick German dude will come along, look at the thing, see, oh, look, a buffer overflow, spend some time on it, and write shellcode for it. Just because it's small, it does not mean nobody's going to be interested in hacking it. And I mean, one of the oldest things, device management is not good by telnet. Do not telnet to your routers. Everyone can read it. So 
HP specific, how do we secure those funny printers? Well, set an admin password. Set SNMP read and write community. Really set it. Don't leave it at public and private. Um, well, add the PGL protection. At least it gives you about five hours. You got about five hours left before you discover that, well, someone broke into your printer. Um, only allow access to the app socket port from print servers. If the only thing talking to your printer is your print server, there is no reason someone else is doing. And I mean seriously, if it's critical, if it's the CEO's printer and he's the only guy printing, there are things like LPT cables. Just because it got a network interface, it doesn't mean you're forced to use it. I mean, you got the choice either buying a firewall for your printers and sitting in front of the printer so only the CEO can print, or buy yourself an LPT cable and connect it to the CEO's machine. That's what they are for, and they still exist, believe me. Also, remove this um, csconfig loader entry. Use our tool, go to the printer, get down the csconfig, remove the whole entry about the loader, put csconfig back on. No more loader. Well, or, as I said, buy a firewall for printers. I might actually selling some. Um, how to protect in Cisco? Well, this is more like a joke, but I couldn't save myself from saying that. Just have no overflows in iOS. Anyone here from Cisco? No? Well, if you know someone, get the message out. Stop copying stuff in buffers that's not big enough. Um, keep your iOS up to date. That's a joke as well. <laughs> because if you keep your iOS up to date, you got more functionality bugs in than you get security bugs out. And you constantly need new hardware, because it constantly needs more memory, more here, more this, more that. And well, Steve probably agrees. The latest and best iOS version is mostly the one that has the lowest uptime. Yeah. <laughs> so this is just the oldest message in security after someone invented passwords. Do not run services you do not need. OK? If you need a service, use authentication. See OSPF. It wouldn't work if you have MD5 authentication. Well, you can put this, this signature here in your network-based IDS, it, or split it in the middle. It will at least see if something that looks like an iOS memory block comes across. And well, ring a bell or whatever your IDS usually does. Um, there is an undocumented com uh, command for iOS that says debug sanity. Um, it's actually, it should be called debug insanity, but um, it really checks the memory blocks a little bit more in depth and a little bit more frequent. So um, if someone is trying to exploit your Cisco, you probably notice it. Unfortunately, this one kicks off after it happened. So when everything is lost, you at least know. There is the absolute hard way saying config register zero. The config register decides on how to boot and what to boot. When it's set to zero, it doesn't boot. It hangs in ROM mode. Problem is, if you don't document this well, and your router is a little bit away, and the next administrator comes along and says, ah, oh, OK, I changed this, I changed that, I have to reload the router. Then you get out the car keys and a map, give it to the admin, and say, bye-bye. Go right to the router, because it's not going to come back up. You need console connection. Oh, by the way, please stop hanging terminal servers in the same network the Cisco's hang on, and like not password protect them. It's nothing like talenting to the terminal server to some high port and finding yourself being enabled on the router. You can save yourself a serious amount of time hacking those things just by like talenting to the IP next to it, which is the terminal server connected to it. Um, perform logging on a separate segment. As I said, the syslog messages are highly variable. And well, protect the syslog host. If someone's breaking into your syslog host, well, happy hacking. That's pretty much it. Um, 
this is like some of the Finalit members, if you ever meet them, so you recognize them. Um, that's pretty much it. Uh, any questions? Please tell me there are questions. One question. All asleep. OK, then no questions. Um, you're probably just not asking questions because there's coffee out there. Um, yeah, thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>